Welcome to the XR Producer Beginner Course by Yahoo. I'm Henry Kaiser, and in this fourth video, we're going to slowly walk you through using the Blender 3D editing software so that you can get a better understanding of how to work with it and hopefully feel really empowered to start telling 3D stories. Uh, Blender is one of those softwares as a 3D editing tool that can just be so daunting if you've never opened 3D software. And while we're going to try to cover a lot in a really short period of time, we're going to hopefully do it slowly and methodically enough that some of your fear may be alleviated and you'll know just enough to begin to do the main couple steps that are required to put together a production. Um, again, this is the fourth video in our nine part series. Previously, we've talked about thinking about your project, listing what needs to go into it, drawing your mockups, and also finding the 3D models that you're going to download so that you're not modeling from scratch as a beginner, you're working with the work of others and then assembling a composition of a story from there. Um, and then of course, in the future episodes, we'll start talking about how do you add more into this project in order to tell the, the fuller story and preparing it for either more advanced technology or more limited platforms. So that said, let's hop into remembering our homework from the last one. We tried downloading from some assets from Sketchfab. Uh, you downloaded probably a few assets of your own and tried importing them into Blender. And that could have been difficult, to be totally honest. And it encounters what we tend to call the snowflake library problem. And that's just to say that every single object in the library was uploaded by a different person who was using a different software, uploading as a different file format. They all have different good habits and bad habits and, and you know, practices that they use. And so what you get from a download may be a really easy asset for you to work with, or it could be something that was made by an expert and they used every trick in the book and it may be very difficult for you to work with as a beginner, or contrary, someone who was really new and uploaded something that was really difficult to work with because they didn't know what they were doing. And now you're stuck trying to make sense of a really difficult file. Um, at the same time, we're going to try to walk you through just a few of the basics that hopefully cover most cases of what am I looking at now that I've imported this thing? And then, of course, how do I start moving it around so that I can at least, even though I don't know all of what this object can do, how do I position it in a scene for a really simple uh, story uh, that I want to execute for XR? So with those imported in, you have components now, and you may be thinking, all right, how do I com compose them in a way that I can start to tell a story? And for that, as I said, we're going to be using Blender. Blender is an open source software, which is really excellent. Um, the reason why we're using Blender is it is a bit of a jack of all trades software. Um, it is there are lots of 3D softwares out there, and many of them are you know industry standards for certain roles. Whereas Blender is kind of you know your B plus student in everything that you tend to need in an XR engine. Um, it is really, really great because of the fact that it also has thousands of other tutorials that are out there on YouTube that you can then use for uh, learning the various things we're not going to drill down on. We're going to keep it really high level, really easy, but there will be things that I will mention even. We're not spending a time on that. Go ahead and check out these videos for more. Um, but it's also an open source software, which means you know it's not developed by a big corporation. It's developed by a foundation that is contributed to by people like you who uh, will then build out more features on top of Blender beyond what it does by default. So if you have a unique niche need, there might be someone else who had that need and has already built a new feature for Blender that you can download and add on to the application that you use. Also, it's free, which is not a bad idea when you're getting started uh, that you don't have to worry about the price point to buy into a certain software. Um, it is free for any type of user forever. And so as you uh, learn this tool, you don't have to worry about, well, my education license is up or what's the site, what's the license type for my large corporation? No worries. So that all said, um, I mentioned right off the bat, there are some great tutorials out there. Two, I cannot promote enough. First is the actual by Blender, Blender 2.8 fundamentals. You may notice I'm, su I'm suggesting people download 2.9 right now. That's one of the newer versions. I think 2.93 is the newest version at the moment. But the reason we talk about 2.8 was 2.8 was a big overhaul for Blender. And so as you search for tutorials, you're looking for tutorials that are for Blender 2.8, 2.9, those are fine. They should be loosely interchangeable for you. Um, whereas anything that's lower than 2.8, 2.7, and so and back, uh, you may not recognize that form of Blender. It will look fairly different. So Blender put out a great playlist of the, all the fundamental things you need to know, really accessibly designed for beginners that walks you through your first time opening up all the way through with some more advanced skills. 
Um, one of the, uh, and it's broken into distinct tasks. Um, whereas if you're somebody who wants to be more project oriented, I love giving people the donut tutorial course by Blender Guru. It's the beginner Blender training course uh, by a man named Andrew Price, who goes by Blender Guru on YouTube. And his multi-part tutorial series will really give you a lot of deeper understanding about how do you execute Blender from a project oriented basis. It's meant for people opening for the first time. I can't uh, support giving that entire playlist to go uh, once you uh, are starting to think, okay, what more can I do beyond this tutorial that we're going to give you just a few minutes today? Where do you get it? We're going to go to blender.org slash download. You'll be prompted with a download button that will work for uh, you know, Windows, but if you are working on a Mac or Linux, there's a drop down usually, or it should identify which type of operating system you're loading into, provide you the right download button for you. Go ahead and take a moment, download that, install it, open it. You can pause here for a minute, then unpause once you've got that all set up. Assuming you've got it set up, then let's go ahead and take a moment of opening the software for the first time. You'll see a little splash screen. You can click past just on the outside to get past that. Um, but then you're probably looking at this and going like, okay. I've never seen a software like this before. What have I gotten myself into? Just own that for a second. I want you to look back on that later today and future projects and remember how frightened you were of the screen. We're gonna make this fairly accessible fairly quickly, okay? So just take a breath. It's a new software, I know, probably an entirely new type of software for you. Let's talk about what do you need to know to work with this? Um, right off the bat, what I want you to know is that really there are just four things that you need to have a basic understanding of so that you can be a bit productive working in Blender as a beginner. These are the four minimum needed skills. Um, so it'll be, how do I look at this screen so I don't have a panic attack? From there, how do I navigate around this screen so that I can kind of look at my 3D scene from lots of perspectives, not just front facing, but front facing, top down, other angles. Um, how do I start to move objects around? So I've learned how to move myself, how do I move objects? And then how do I switch between some of the viewing modes just so I can see it in different ways, depending on how I'm trying to work on my scene at that moment. Which commonly, it's really about how do we switch you into material preview, which is just a different starting way of looking at your project than the way that Blender's gonna open by default. So first things first, how do I look at this screen? It's got a lot of stuff going on. You can visually break it into a few chunks and you'll start to understand, okay, this is doing this, this is this, this is this, this is this. And it immediately it'll start to become a little bit less intimidating. The middle of your screen, that's your 3D viewport. That is the area you're going to do a lot of your work. Um, it's where, you, where you're positioning and rotating objects. It's going to be where you're kind of inspecting the scene that you're building. It's worth noting when your cursor is over that space, certain keys and things will do different actions than when those keys and your cursor are over different parts of the window. You don't have to worry about that too much today, but it's just worth noting if I say hit this button, it may also say with your cursor over the viewport if your cursor somewhere else, it's not going to do the same thing. Top right hand corner is going to be your scene collection. The scene collection is just an outline of all of the parts of things that are in your project. That will be your 3D objects. It could also be things like cameras and lights, which are necessary when people make videos and screenshots and photos using Blender. Um, we will not be working with cameras and lights for our purposes, but it's worth noting that that is something that is going to go deep on maybe the Blender Donut tutorial and some of the other Blender tutorials you see out there, which are more focused on setting a rendered image or a rendered animation. Bottom right hand corner is your properties menu. Your properties menu is where you're going to find kind of the detailed variables for the thing that you're currently have active, the object you're currently clicked on. Um, and it also includes its own vertical sub menu kind of all these little tabs for a variety of different properties. There's a lot more than we need to go into today, but we will talk about just two of them in a second, which will be the main place we're looking. Bottom of your screen, that's a timeline for when you're working with animation. Of course, your space bar by chance, you'll see that the timeline will run for a moment. No need to worry about that. We're not going into animation during this tutorial. The last thing I want you to note is at the very top of your screen, besides the usual area where you'll see things like file, edit, render, render window, and help, you'll see then a couple more that are kind of looks like tabs as well. Those are other workspaces that you might use for specific types of tasks in Blender. So they will redesign the screen. So instead of having scene collection properties, you might look like something a little bit different for uh, nuanced types of actions. So this, we are currently in the layout tab. It's where you're going to lay out your project generally. But if you were sculpting, you might go to the sculpting tab. And there is one other we will use today. And we'll show you that when we come to it in a bit. 
Uh, with that done, again, you can see that I'm currently in Blender. I am running an extension that allows me to show the keys that I'm pressing. So you should be able to follow along with what keys I'm pressing along with where my cursor is. This is not default. I have this turned on just for this tutorial. Um, however, let's talk more about uh, the properties. So again, our outline is here. Our scene collection is here. We're not worried about that at this moment. We're coming down to this zone, which is where we have our properties window. With all of these many, 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 many tabs that are right here, I want you to, in your brain, just draw a line right through the middle, basically right above the orange square and right below this little carton. And in that line, that sort of tell us that everything above that line are project level properties, things like uh, what type of file am I rendering? What's the lighting engine like? What is the uh, background for this scene? If I have a background image that's not 3D, but it's the sky for my project. Below this line are things that are object level properties. So if I've clicked on my cube, all of these properties from here down are related to the cube. If I click on my camera, all of these from this point down are related to my camera. And you can see even that they've changed because the types of properties you have are different for cameras than for 3D objects. If I click on my light, you can see the same, that this is now a different set of properties for the light as opposed to the cube and so forth. The things above this point have not changed. The things below do change because the things below are object level. The only two sets of properties I want you to even remotely worry about right now are this one, this orange rectangle or orange square that is the object properties or the transform properties. This is where you will find the object's location, rotation, and scale typed out. So if the object moves, you'll see that its location will move, or if its object is rotated, you'll see that the rotation has been written as different. Um, and the second thing I want you to know about is this lower one, the material properties. It kind of looks like a red sphere or a red BMW logo, you might hear me call it. Uh, this down here talks about the colors, the properties of the materials of the cube. So is my cube white or is my cube white and it has a high level of metallic? So that way it's reflective white. Is it metallic and it's also got a low roughness? So it's almost like a mirror white. Um, and so these are where we talk about how does something look and where is something. That's the only two I want you to worry about for today. The rest you may pick up in time. We will touch on the modifier property in episode seven. So with that said, you've got a little bit of experience now how to look at the screen. It's various workspaces where we're using a layout for now animation timeline, properties, and our outline of all of the objects in our project called the scene collection. Next, it's about understanding how do I navigate myself inside of this space? We are now working in three dimensions. So it's not just you scroll left, right, up, down, like you might with a Word document or, or a slide or a spreadsheet. Uh, instead, you're talking about rotation and strafing and so forth. So let's talk about what does your mouse do or what does your trackpad do? right now as you're going to be clicking and navigating. If you're working with a mouse, we'll go over that left click. If you're talking with a, a trackpad, we're talking about one finger click on the keyboard. Left clicking selects objects, if it's just a click. Left clicking and dragging should provide a rectangle select tool. That allows you to select more than one object at a time. However, your properties will only reflect the one that is yellow as in the, the object that is active. So even though I have more than one thing selected, Right now, this is still the part that's yellow. I may have to click on something else or to change what the properties is, re is reflecting. So left click and drag a rectangle select box. Next is if you're working with a standard uh, modern three button mouse, what we call a left click, right click, and a mouse wheel mouse. Clicking in the mouse wheel is how we are going to rotate. If you're working with a trackpad, what you will do is you'll put two fingers together on your trackpad almost like if you're doing in America what we call the Cub Scout sign, uh, and you will slide two fingers around on the trackpad. And sliding those two fingers around should allow your scene to kind of rotate um, around the middle of your scene, or really it's around the middle of the, select, of, of the, the viewport. That is how we do our rotation. So go ahead and take a moment and just rotate all the way around your cube and come back to your starting perspective. Next, after you've done a little bit of rotating, we need to talk about how do we actually slide ourselves to look, you know, to move from left to right, not just rotate. 
Rotate may seem like it covers all of your needs when you're only working with a single object that's dead center. But as soon as you start having a scene that has different things placed in different positions, you need to be able to move yourself left and right, up and down, look underneath the tabletop, look in between two objects, and so forth. So to do that, you're going to use the same uh, technique that you just did to rotate, whether that was two fingers together or clicking down on the mouse wheel. But you're also going to hold shift on your keyboard while you do this action. So while I'm holding shift, I can now press what I did to rotate and move. And instead of rotating, I am sliding left and right, or I'm sliding up and down. And that allows me to actually change my perspective. So let's say if I want to rotate around this part point out here, I can slide it into the middle of my scene. And now I can rotate around that point. If I want to come back to my cube, I can hold shift, come back and put my cube in the middle of the scene. And then now I'm rotating around my cube. So again, rotate is either middle mouse button or clicking down the mouse wheel or two fingers together on a trackpad and sliding to slide your position. You're holding shift while doing that. This is why I usually tell people, I want you to run two laps around the field as though you're back in gym class. And what I mean by that is I want you to do a shift, rotate, shift, rotate, shift, rotate, shift, rotate, as if you're running a lap around a track. So shift, rotate, shift, rotate, shift, rotate, shift, rotate, and back to our starting point. I want you to give me two laps all the way around. And while this may feel like, oh, this is so strange and why are we doing this? If you're not comfortable changing your perspective in Blender, you won't get comfortable with anything else. It's the most fundamental thing you need to be a bit comfortable with. So run those laps, make sure you feel a bit comfortable. And then when you're ready, let's keep going. So if you finish your laps, let's not talk about, you know, of course, the thing that most people always say, I can't see something very well, I need to zoom in. If you have a mouse wheel, you'll be spinning that mouse wheel to zoom in. If you're using a trackpad, you'll be doing your two fingers uh, pinching and zooming in order to zoom in and out. Um, and so if you're the same as if you were working on a smartphone, you'll just do two fingers together, kind of pinching and zooming. If you find that these controls are really uncomfortable for you, Blender 2.8 and 2.9 do have a new system for moving around, which is if you look in the top right corner of your viewport, you'll see both a six cardinal direction widget which is our six cardinal directions of 3D, as well as a zooming widget and a hand widget. Clicking with a one finger click on the cardinal directions widget will allow you to rotate. Clicking with a one finger click on the zooming magnifying glass will allow you to zoom. And then clicking and dragging with the uh, cursor over the hand move icon will allow you to move. And this way you do not necessarily need to have access to anything more than a single left click we have accessibility concerns, we have a different type of computer, that right-hand corner of uh, widgets will help you navigate when you're in a bind. The last thing I wanna point out to you as a way of, oh my gosh, I've gotten myself lost, is a get out of jail free trick that I like to call uh, the tilde key trick. And so if anyone has not known what the tilde key is, it is the key that is above the tab on the keyboard to the left of the one on the American keyboard. It is a little squiggly uh, line and a little, uh, downward, uh, almost like apostrophe symbol, forgetting the name of it right now. Uh, but what that will allow you to do is with your cursor over the 3D viewport, pressing the tilde key will bring up a context menu of where do you want to view. And so from this menu, you can choose view selected and view selected will always snap back to the object that is currently in yellow. So here, if I have my cube in yellow, and I let my cube get strangely out of frame, I maybe I'm struggling to get back to see it, I can press my tilde key, choose view selected, and I'm back on my cube. This is also great for if you've really thoroughly gotten lost, and you're like, I can't even, maybe I'm struggling to click the cube, it's a really weird position to be at. You can also select your object in the scene collection. I can choose cube, bring my cursor back over, tilde key, view selected, and I'm right back to the object that I was looking for. So that's your get out of jail free trick. If you have kind of gotten yourself disoriented, you're having a hard time lighting up your camera, just remember the teal, the key, and you'll find your way back. So we've gone ahead, we've navigated around the viewport. Now let's talk about moving an object. So there are three main ways we move an object. We've introduced these in the verb section. That is position, rotation, and scale, also called location, rotation, and scale, or move, rotate, and scale. So 
in that vein, these three tools are represented here in the top left corner. And so with my cube selected, I can now click on this move tool and I will see a widget that compares, that's actually called a manipulator tool. And it has three arrows. And these three arrows cor uh, correspond to the cardinal directions of the 3D project. So if I click and drag on the blue arrow, it will move up and down. If I click and drag on the green arrow, it'll move up along the Y axis. If I click and drag on the red arrow, it'll move along the X axis. Um, if I miss, or if I click in the middle, it will move freely. But I really advise you not to do that because it is very difficult to line something up freely. Um, also, this is a great time to mention, if you ever need to undo something you've done, our favorite friend still exists. You go to Control Z, and you can Control Z multiple times and undo yourself back a previous state. So with my object center, what I want you guys to take a moment to do is to move this cube into the corner of the green and the red line with the base of it on the grid. So take a moment to do that. I'll do it as well. But if you want to do it without just following along with me or to find your way there, go ahead and get started. I'm just going to move myself into position. But I haven't changed my perspective yet. As soon as I change my perspective, I might find, oh, actually, you know, this is not too bad, but I'm going to be a little over the red line. So let me zoom in and make sure it's lined up there. Change perspective. Oh, I'm way away from the green line here. Change perspective. Check the floor. I'm, I'm pretty close above the floor. I could probably be a little bit lower, but that's that should be enough. So I've moved my cube into this position with the arrows. Go ahead and do the same. Next, we're going to use the rotate tool. The rotate tool, when you click on this, changes our arrows into arcs. And each of those arcs represent rotating along a certain axis. So if I rotate on the green, I'm rotating along the Y axis. If I rotate on the red, I'm rotating around the X axis. If I rotate along the blue, I'm rotating around the, the Z axis. So you can see that by clicking on them, and if you've got it clicked right on the blue, you should only see a blue axis while you do your rotation. Let that do. If you miss or you click in between, again, you will free rotate. Free rotate can be a bit chaotic. Maybe that's your goal sometimes. But generally, I advise people away from using free rotate. Instead, try to be really accurate and specific using the red, green, and blue arcs themselves. What I want you to do now is take a moment and go ahead and stand up this cube on its point on this location right here. So for myself, I might do that by standing it up a little bit on edge and then rotating to put one of the points straight down. But you may notice, of course, I'm not on this anymore. So I still need to go back to my arrows, use my arrows to try to line it up with this point in space. Not great, but it's close. You may be having a harder time. Maybe you're having an easy time. But the goal is to get it so that you stood up in point. It's kind of lean forward a little bit, but I think that's enough for the purposes of this exercise. See what you can do really quickly. But the goal here is to get you a bit of a direction around applying these first experiences with these manipulators. From there, let's just talk about scaling. Scaling with position and rotate, I said I want you to grab the arrows exactly. However, with scaling, if you grab an arrow, one of the green, red, or blue knobs, you're only scaling along that vector. So I'm only scaling along red right then. I'm only scaling along blue. It can be a little bit disorienting, especially if you've downloaded a 3D object and you're not trying to squish it or stretch it like Stretch Armstrong. Instead, you're trying to just make it bigger, make it smaller. In those cases, what you want to be doing is, as I undo, uh, you want to actually intentionally now miss. You want to click either dead center or click off onto the side along the white edge. And here you can just scale up and down uh, evenly and uniformly. So go ahead and give that a try going with, with scaling. With that done, we're going to take a moment to just try to undo ourselves back to our first state. If that's difficult, uh, it's because sometimes you can run out of undos. Um, what I like to tell people is if you need to get one of these default objects back to its original state, one of the easier ways of doing it, you can always delete the object. Um, what I've just done is I've right clicked or you know, with your uh, trackpad, you can use your two fingers and just two finger click. That will bring up the object context menu. 
and you can hit delete. And then we can add our primitive similar to what we did when we built our skeleton scene. We can add back a plane or a cube or a sphere. So I'm just gonna add a cube back, which I know will be dead center again and same as what we started with. So with those done, let's talk about, you know, you, you moved an object around a bit, you've moved yourself around in the process of doing so. Um, some people who might be a little more experienced may have been screaming at the screen, why are you rotating around so much? There are in these six cardinal direction widgets, the ability to snap to a certain perspective. Snapping to a certain perspective can be really useful for directly lining up a position and then rotating exactly to another side or to another angle and seeing, you know, if I wanted to put something in a corner, I can put it right there, rotate, put it in the corner. And now, unlike when we worked in 3D, we've got it there much easier perhaps. Depends on what, what you feel is easier. Um, the other thing is um, with our transform properties, if I want to put something in a corner, and I know the size of my object, and I know where the center of my object or really where the point is that we call the origin point. We're not gonna go into that during this training program. I can, you know, look at where I got close to putting something. So for example, like that's kind of close, but here on my object properties, I can see my location is a rounded version of one, a rounded version of one, a rounded version of one. I could just type in that one, one, and one, and now my object is dead center on that point that I was trying to line it up with. This is exactly as exact can be. Um, so there are lots of ways of accomplishing a task in Blender depending on what approach you're looking to use. But as we uh, move forward, I wanna point out that uh, we are working with a cube so far that we've moved. We haven't talked about how do you tell if it looks correct? What is the colors correct? Um, and that involves the shading modes of Blender. In this top right corner, you'll find four icons, these four spheres. There's the first one, which is wireframe, solid, material preview, and render. When you open a new project of Blender, you will open initially in solid mode, in which case all objects are going to load as gray. Um, and so while they are this color, this is great for sometimes sculptors who are trying to see shadows really well, but they're not trying to worry about the color of things yet. Um, wireframe, which is the one before that, allows you to see through objects and just see their edges. But what we will do most of our work in is material preview. Material preview just turns on color for an object. So in solid, we are just a, a flat gray. Here, you can see that we are white. And if we go check our BMW logo, our material properties icon down here in the corner, you'll find that our cube has no materials applied so far. So when I hit new, I can see that, oh, my base color is white. If I click on this base color, I can change it to a different color that I will see when I'm in material preview, but I won't see when I'm in solid or wireframe, okay? Render is a more advanced mode that uses lighting and shadows and reflections more accurately. However, the render engines in Blender don't necessarily reflect the render engines you will find in Sketchfab or some other type of tool. It's worth noting that, you know, if you, unless you are designing just for Blender and your whole product will stay in there and be rendered out as an image or as a movie, um, that more often than not, it's kind of worthwhile to work in Material Preview uh, because that may more closely reflect some other uh, external applications to work with going forward. With that set, I've got a color added. I've changed my material preview mode so that I can see the color that I've added for an object. Uh, that is your main minimum skills. You know how to look around, move your object, and see the colors throughout it, and potentially tweak a color if it's just a matter of changing material property. Our first assignment now then is we're gonna quickly create a pin, a sewing pin. Uh, and so in a new project, let's go ahead and you know, file new general project. Don't save, unless you really like your cube and you wanna bring it back. When you get into a new project, we're gonna select all the things that are currently in there. We're gonna right click and delete them away just to give ourselves a blank canvas to start with. We're gonna create a sewing pin, which you may see is two of the primitive objects that kind of work together. Um, we'll be working with a sphere and a cone. Um, 
If you want to try to figure out how to make this image on screen yourself, go ahead and take a few minutes and pause. You can walk and do it afterwards. Or if you want to follow along directly, we'll start by going to add mesh sphere and then add mesh cone. Now, this of course does not look like a sewing pin yet. So the next thing we might do is we might take our sphere and move it maybe up a little bit to give ourselves room for the rest of our pin. So I'll move it up. And then with our cone, we're going to think, all right, I need to put the pin, probably the tip of it facing away from the head. So we're gonna grab our rotate tool. We're gonna to rotate it over. If you wanna do it all by hand, that's fine. If you want to be a bit more advanced, you can also come to the rotation X, which is what I just rotated on. And you could change this to 180, which would make it exactly pointing down. From there, we're scaling this time. We're gonna take the scale of this because this is not quite looking like the same shape as we see in the image. The top of the head kind of does. And so I might scale this to make it a little bit thinner. It's like so. Rotate to the side, scale it to make it thinner again. We're looking pretty close. Looks a little bit chunky still. Maybe there's about rounded. And then we may move it up. And, oh, it doesn't quite, maybe it's not as long as I'd like. I'll scale an extra time, scaling in that direction. There we are. We got something that kind of resembles a sewing pin now. You may want to tweak the scales more for your own liking. Um, you may want to change the colors on something. Maybe I want this to have a purple head, kind of like a Yahoo purple. This isn't exactly Yahoo purple. I'm just using the object select. But wait, why didn't my color come through? because we created a new project and we didn't switch from solid mode to material preview. Come back to our top right corner and we switch to material preview mode. And now I can see my purple pin head on top of a, a long silver pin. If I want it to be more metallic looking, I could add a material to my pin needle if I wanted to. And we can make it white still. Maybe I just make it more metallic. So maybe it looks a little shinier uh, as opposed to just flat white. Once you've done this, we're going to do one last thing. If you see, we still have two objects in our project, but maybe we want them to go one object called pin. To do this, we're going to select both objects, uh, which we can do by just stretching a box across them. That's fine. Or clicking on one, holding shift on the keyboard. Oh, let me show you my keys. Clicking on one and holding shift on the keyboard and clicking on another. So they're both selected. And then we're going to right click or two finger click on the object and choose join. By pressing join, these two objects have now become one object. And if we look at our scene collection, we can see that they are now one object. It does take the name of the one that's active at the time of joining. So this one became called cone. Uh, but if I want, I can double click on it and now we can rename this pin. Having finished our pin, let's just go ahead and save this as a project called uh, pin dot thumb or something, or pin dot blend. I'll call this pin dot blend. And save it somewhere that you can find it again later. And there we are. We've completed this short exercise project. We'll talk for a quick second about joining. Joining is one of the common ways that people will bring objects together, but there is a different method, which is used a lot more commonly in 3D art, and that's called parenting. So joining makes two objects one, but now each of those objects are harder to edit respectively. It might be really hard for me now to go back and change my sphere without also changing the pin. Um, however, parenting is a technique where one object now follows the lead of another object becomes the child of the parent. And so these two objects can kind of be moved together, but it does not add some complexity to your project. You can follow along if you like, but I'm gonna go fairly quickly through this section. Um, if I uh, create a new project, um, and in this product, I make not just one cube, but I make, let's say, two more. Uh, and because they're loading on top of each other, I might move this one here, that one there, and I'll add a third cube. I have three cubes now. Each cube moves independently of the others because they are all separate objects in our scene collection. I'm going to quickly delete the camera and the lights just because they are not necessary for this example. Um, we can see we have three cubes that move independently of each other. If I wanted to move them all together, I have two choices. I could parent two of the cubes to one of the others, 
this would involve clicking and dragging on one of the cubes. And you can see in my tooltip for my scene collection, it says while I'm holding down shift to parent. So I'm not holding here. Let me turn on my script, my keys again with this add on. Uh, while I'm holding on my cube, it says I can just release to move it inside a collection, or I can also hold shift to parent. So while I'm holding shift, I can put my cube over another and it says drop to set parent. So now this cube is a child of this cube. It is, and so if I move this one, its parent doesn't move. But if I move the parent, the child moves also. If I put the third cube inside of this one as well, now if I move this cube, it does it moves on its own. The child moves on its own. But when the parent moves, both children come with the parents. This is one technique. What's a lot more common, however, and I'm going to undo back to them all being equals again. What's a lot more common for 3D artists is that they will parent their children to an empty. And what an empty is, is it's functionally a parenting tool that is used to move multiple objects together. And empty is unlike other 3D objects, which also have their own shape. So this cube has a location, rotation, scale, but it also has a general shape to it. It has these six faces, these eight vertices, so forth. Um, an empty, however, if I go to add empty, and I'm going to choose the plane axis icon. These are all just different icons for the various types of, uh, for the just a, a visualizing an empty a different way. In plane axis, I can have now added an empty to my scene. This empty may have a point in them itself in space, but it has no actual shape to it. And these lines even are not actually represented in your 3D model. They are just there in Blender to give you a visual icon of where your empty is currently positioned. Then I can take these cubes and parent them to the empty. So now I can move all three cubes together by moving the empty, but no one cube is actually in charge of any of the other cubes. I can move each of them independently and there's no visible object that's actually in charge of them. This is an invisible object when it gets exported, except it does move these objects together. The reason I bring this up is that you are going to be working with empties. Every single object you download from Sketchfab uses empties. Um, Sketchfab even applies a few at the very top to hold the whole scene together. So when you are working with empties, if you want to move a group together, you cannot then just click on an object and move and think you're moving the whole batch. You need to click on the empty, probably in the scene collection, because it can be hard to find them in the viewport but click on your empty in the scene collection, find wherever your arrows appear, and then move to those arrows, as opposed to just clicking on something and moving it, because now you might have thought, oh, let me move the whole car. You click on the car, and all you did was move the tire. And you'll probably see that in a minute as we now open up our Mars scene in a second. So that said, there's a really quick technique you can do to undo a bunch of empties that are, or a bunch of objects that are joined together in an empty. Um, if you want to get them out, this is a really simple scene. You could drag them out individually, but a fast technique, if you have a really complex one, and again, we'll see that in a second with the Mars scene, is in my scene collection, what I can do is I can select the hierarchy of the empty. That means select me and all of my children beneath me. So by doing that, you can see I've selected hierarchy on the empty. It has highlighted all the children as well. From there, what I can do is I can shift click on one of the objects and I can either unparent it to try to pull out all the pieces, right click, clear parents, and all of the cubes come out together. But what happens if, and you're going to see this with the Mars piece in a moment, you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of little components. Well, this is not recommended for advanced personnel, but if you're a beginner, this can be a little bit easier. You can join all those many components into one remaining object, similar to what we did with the pin, so that you can move around a really complex object a little easier as a beginner. So back to where we were a minute ago. All my cubes are inside of this empty. I want to get them out and I want to make them move around as a single object now. I can do select hierarchy and then I can shift click on one of the actual 3D objects, not one of the empties. I can right click 
and I can choose join. Same as what we do with the pin. When I do this, now what I'm left with is one object, which represents all the components of that 3D assembly, and my empty is left on its own. And maybe there's more than one empty. You'll see that with the marsh piece in a moment. So now if I want to get my single object out, I can right click. There's a menu specifically about parenting and I can say clear and keep transformation. When I do that, my cube or my object is now separate from my empties. I can come to my empty and I can delete hierarchy and that will get rid of all of the empty or empties that are still in there. So let's see this in action. Let's go over to our Mars scene. Now that we're in our Mars scene that involves a, our two objects that have been imported in, we have our 3D rover and we have our uh, planets that imported in kind of below the scene. Let's talk about how do we go ahead and put these into our position. You see that they both came in as over a large tree of empties. All these little black lines are empties that were part of the 3D model that we imported. It might be frightening or might be, you know what, I can work with this. I feel, I feel confident. In which case, yes, you can click on the top empty for a certain object, go to your arrows, and move around the whole group yourself. So here, for example, I'm moving the planet. This is the, the root node and the whole tree for the planet or I can click on this one and move around the rover. And this will move all of the children of the rover. But what we can also do instead is if we think, I don't feel comfortable moving uh, the empty around, I want to just uh, join all into a single object now and get rid of all the empties. Well, let's look at the rover then, for example. I'm going to select the hierarchy for the rover. And while we're at this, what I will do quickly is I will remove the placeholders we have in our skeleton scene. I will now back to, I will select the hierarchy for my rover. I will hold shift on my keyboard and let me show you the keys that I'm pressing. Uh, let me hold shift on my keyboard and click on some part of the rover. Doesn't really matter which, but there are hundreds and hundreds of objects inside of this rover. Holding shift, there's some part that's now selected in yellow. You can kind of faintly see it. I can click on another or another. We'll see that some parts are being selected in yellow. Then right click and join. And now my rover, while there's still lots of empties around, is one object. I can now just click on my rover and move it around as needed. To get rid of the empties, as I talked about before, you will uh, need to click on the rover first. You want to make sure that only the rover is selected, not all of the empties and things. So just the rover is selected in yellow. We're going to clear parent and keep transformation, which means clear all of my parents, but keep me looking exactly as I am now. And so now we can see that I have in my scene collection, mesh 38, that's what it got renamed to. I can now call this Mars Rover. And I can see that here is just a giant tree of empties that no longer have any 3D models inside of them. To get rid of those, I can now just delete hierarchy. And all of those empties are gone, and I'm left with just a 3D model, which is a little easier to work with for a beginner. Again, not what most advanced people would do. If we want to go back and edit something, we can't do it so easily now that it's all joined. But this might be easier for you to work with as a beginner. Same with the planets. I can see that I have a bunch of empties before I get down to my eventual 3D object. This icon is object, that icon is empty. What I can do is I can select hierarchy, hold shift to click on my planet, join, then clear parent and sorry, click away and make sure only your object you're trying to now clear parent is selected, clear parent and keep transformation. And now I can see that my little mesh zero is out here. We can call this Mars planet. And then we are going to delete the hierarchy for all the empties that are left behind from that. So now I have, again, once again, just a few objects in my space, the floor, the Mars rover, and the planet. We'll talk more about how we can improve the visual fidelity of the floor in the next episode. But for now, let's go ahead and do one last thing we need to do, which is move our uh, 3D models into the collection. 
So we are going to take the Mars planet and we can just drag it into the collection and the Mars rover and click and drag and bring it into the collection. We're not holding shift this time with parents. We're just dragging it in. Once they're all three in here, we're done. Now I will show really quickly. There is a way of bringing it over when it is empties. So back to our scene as we had imported, as we had opened it, getting rid of these placeholders. What we can do is we can uh, just click on the empty, move our objects into position. Oh, we're going to move just the planet into position. Uh, and then good habit to rename these so you know which one you're working with. Mars planet, Mars rover. We need to move not just the empty, but all of its children into the collection with it. So in this case, we can't just click on this and drag it over because we're leaving the children behind. Instead, hitting undo, we're going to select hierarchy and then bring the entire hierarchy over. And then again, select hierarchy, bring the entire hierarchy over. This way they should come over, they should still have all of their constituent parts for future editing. And instead of having a object icon though, it will show the empty icon at the highest level. You'll have to expand, expand, expand before you start to get down to where the objects are. So for your homework, go ahead and take the assets you've downloaded from your session three homework, the one about the story that you are planning, import those into your scene, according to uh, you know, what was the mock-up images from your session two, join any assets, clear any empties as you desire or as you need, but then also show your now new three scene to a partner, to a colleague and ask, hey, um, can you kind of understand the story without me explaining anything to you? So just show them the scene and say like, hey, do you know what this is? And see if they can tell you, is it about this? And then you might you'll know you're on the right track. Otherwise, you might identify, identify, you may need to add some more 3D assets, or we'll talk in the next episode about how to add more context to your project. Good luck. I'll see you then.